All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Jack Lazarchak, and I'm a developer at Chariot Solutions. Imagine this scenario. You've just finished a ticket that took you longer than you thought it would. The pull request was merged, it was deployed, life is good. Relief that you can finally move on to something else, you start looking into your next ticket. Then all of a sudden, you look up to see your new coworker at your desk. In this hypothetical example, we can call this hypothetical person, I don't know, Pete Fleming, for example. He's explaining to you that he's going to work to integrate UI, UX design into the project, and that ticket you thought you finished isn't done. You'll have to reopen that ticket and make some adjustments to the design for usability. The calm world you thought you'd built for yourself comes crashing down around you as you question if you're going to get along with your new coworker. Full disclaimer, Pete Fleming is not a hypothetical person, and this situation was not a hypothetical one. Of course, I was joking about my aforementioned disdain for my coworker. Pete has, of course, you know, shown me uh, how great it is to have UI and UX considerations made uh, and how much easier that could actually make a developer's job. So I imagine our next presenter is no stranger to the situation I just described. Uh, here to explain how to integrate product design into your SDLC is Director of UI and UX at Vertex Inc., Josh Smith. And just before I hand it over, I wanted to take a big moment to thank, uh, to thank you, Josh, and everybody watching remotely. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't you know, all meet in person this year, but I've, I've really been enjoying this virtual conference. So it's been, it's been great to spend uh, all this time with everybody. So uh, over to you, Josh. Thank you, Jack. That's quite a scenario. <laughs> um, I hope by the end of this, we can come to some conclusion about that. Um, my, but yeah, my name is Josh Smith. I'm the director of UI UX at Vertex. I've been, um, I've been specializing in design leadership within the enterprise space in southeastern Pennsylvania for the last eight years. Uh, the last three positions I've had, um, I, just, I was placed in, in opportunities to find ways to integrate product design into, um, yeah, into engineering teams and into uh, connection with product. So just, just so happened that, you know, that, that was an opportunity that folks said um, I, I was helpful in. So I just continued doing that and here I am still doing it and I love it. Um, but yeah, I work out at Vertex and King of Prussia. Uh, it is an enterprise, if you don't know it, it's an enterprise um, uh, company uh, internationally that provides tax solutions. Um, and um, let's jump right in. So uh, with design operations, uh, or with, with integrating design into an organization to scale. First thing I wanna jump into is some quick numbers about the value of that. So McKinsey and Company uh, over a period of five years, uh, not too long ago, took a look at 300 organizations, enterprise organizations, and uh, assessed their design maturity in their organizations. And they, over a period of, uh, of five years, they looked at the top quartile of those organizations that invested the most in design. And they were able to correlate it to these kinds of numbers for the business. And this is helpful because these are numbers that uh, with, with design as a practice within an organization, especially an organization, an enterprise organization, it's hard to really correlate this um, like 20, 15, 20 years ago. Whereas now we, we're, we're getting this kind of research, this kind of investigation about its value. I think more relevant to, to the engineering teams, though, is some work that Forrester does. So Forrester uh, has these great economic impact uh, studies that they do with organizations. I don't know if anyone is aware, but IBM, um, gosh, must have been five, seven years ago, uh, made a huge investment in design. Um, and uh, they, they worked with Forrester to identify the impact that that had. And they were able to correlate that investment uh, with these kinds of outcomes to the business. Recently too, uh, if anyone knows the Scaled Agile Framework for Enterprise, their 5.0 version came out in January, and they started adding some pieces that designers had been advocating for uh, in, in the integration of repre representation of product development, and we're getting some validation from, from frameworks like SAFE that, yes, this, this, this is important. This is an important part of the process now. It's not something on the outside that may be a nice to have. So what's happening is maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the, per, the perception of design was that it's the thing that you invest in to make your software look pretty. We're starting to see now that that's becoming more of a laggard perception of design and the more progressive, progressive perception of design within an enterprise organization is those skills are the, that's the stuff that helps connects your business objectives over here with the customer's experience. 
And when I mean that, when I, when I think of design as a connection, you know, looking at one end and thinking we really need to know what's viable to the business and we have folks with deep skills in that, in that area. And we need to understand what's feasible to implement and maintain. And we have deep skills there. We also need to be cognizant of the skills that connect the two. And I say skills intentionally over positions uh, because I think that in many respects, these skills aren't necessarily or should be confined just to a person, although we, we would like folks to have deep, deep proficiency in these. But what, what is desirable to the customer? What is the experience? What is the thing that can bridge the two? So when you're, a, when you're an SMB, when you're just a couple teams, those design skills may be distributed. You, know, you may have product leaders who are doing wireframing, who are coordinating directly with the engineering team. You may have engineering teams that are coordinating on what that experience should be. There may be instances in an SMB where you don't have a designer and that's, that may be okay because you have those skill sets. There comes a time though, especially as you grow, when you become an enter enterprise organization, that, that there's this pressure to specialize. And the specialization and on top of the need to align your processes, your standards, your frameworks across all of these teams can cause a gap. You have product suddenly saying, we've got a lot to carry here. We've got a lot of things that are valuable to the business and understanding what's viable and understanding our vision. And you've got engineering say, we now have to figure out how to operationalize and standardize a lot of skills, a lot of proficiencies uh, in, in what to implement, what to maintain. Sometimes that can create a, a gap when you, when you have that level of specialization where um, you can get some, some symptoms. So if you see some of these symptoms on, in your organization, you know, um, early pivoting, because we're not really clear what solution we're building and we have to spend a lot of time up front in, in early sprints trying to figure that out. Um, maybe there's a lot of rework post-launch because we're not sure, maybe we weren't entirely confident that what we had uh, released really matched the, in, the intent of the opportunity and the outcomes we were looking to achieve. Um, an uptick in support or training um, maybe a concern about sales impediments that what we believed was, was the, the, our customers wanted and what we actually gave them. Maybe there wasn't a complete alignment. Um, a, maybe a concern about renewal losses and more, most uh, importantly, especially if you're an enterprise, uh, fractured experiences. Well, gosh, we have all of these services. They're, they're not starting to look the same <laughs> uh, or interact the same. And we, in the instance we know our customers are using all of them, that, that, can, um, that can compromise trust. So this is where enterprise organizations sometimes say, okay, let's, let's look at design. Let's see, what does it look like to invest in design? But there's kind of this added layer to it. It's not just investing in design, it's investing in design to scale. Because if you're an enterprise organization and uh, maybe especially if maybe you had one or two designers at that time and you say, well, now, well, how, do we, how, do we, how do we expand that? Or maybe you, you haven't at all invested in design and you say, well, let's, let's build that. How do you do that with all of these folks? Uh, so that's where design operations can come in. And that's where design operations becomes critical for an enterprise organization. Uh, Nielsen Norman Group has a great definition here. Um, so I, I love the word orchestration. Because yeah, you're you're orchestrating. Um, you're not only orchestrating uh, a, a practice of folks, but you're you're kind of figuring out what is the syncopation, the tension between that and the other practices around you, um, to achieve your outcomes. Uh, and then on the right, you have the breadth of design ops. So, uh, design ops is more than just production or integration with the software development lifecycle. When designers talk about design ops, they're just looking at everything. <laughs> everything what all the things that need to scale so that which includes things like what is your career pathing um how do designers collaborate with one another how do they collaborate with their team members um what does the education look like how do we how do we communicate out with the design industry and expand into thought leadership 
So it's a whole bunch of stuff. For the purpose of this conversation though, I can't talk about all the things, but I'd like to focus just on a couple in relation to engineering teams and enterprise organizations. So if you wanted to invest in design to scale, let's talk about org structure first. So this is, this is one scenario that plays out when enterprise organizations want to invest in design, where you have a leader in product, or it, it could be someone outside of product, but there's this decision that designers should be centralized and operate as a service on an as needed basis. There's a, there's a leader somewhere that manages that relationship and they believe, well, I'll reach out to design based on what I believe is necessary for my project. They ask for it. Designers say, yep, got it. Here you go. There might be some back and forth and refinement and then it gets sent over to the team to build. Hey, here's your solution. Go build it. I can't see, I, I can't, I can't see anyone, but I would ask, you know, who's, who's experienced that where you feel like the, the design team is, the designers are a team unto themselves and they're off over there. It, it can cause some responses. Um, I can't build this. Like, do these designers even know code? Um, this is not even possible. Um, they don't even match our product. They sent, they sent us stuff a month ago and then they send us this, something else and they both have date pickers and this date picker does not look like the date picker they sent me a month ago. Um, as a member of the engineering team, I have some ideas about emerging technologies and that could have uniquely served this opportunity. And I just received a solution, but I want to speak into that. I, I wish I was brought forward more. Um, you get answers like, well, did we, did we test these with users? What, what was the strategy for engaging with customers to validate this solution? Um, and just general uh, desire to want to contribute and make sure your ideas uh, were brought to the table and were incorporated in, into uh, what, what this team was building. We want a sense of ownership in, in what we're building. And without that kind of engagement, we kind of feel at a loss. Uh, we could maybe gravitate towards the fellow on the right. I guess I'll just relegate myself to doing what I'm told and just operating in the feature factory. Sometimes teams just go on the opposite end and say, oh, we got to fix this. Let's put them all in the, let's take our designers and distribute them all to the teams. If those teams are already in a culture that is siloed from one another and those designers happen to also not be reporting within the same org structure, that can cause its own set of problems. When a designer leaves a team, especially in an enterprise organization, if a designer moves from one team and another designer comes in, how are we confident that we know what we're going to expect from this designer? Their processes, how they work with the team, what the expectations are, uh, you have no idea. There's some fear there. Um, how do we know that all these designers are operating the same, they're designing the same, um, that, that there's cohesion across if they're not communicating with one another? Uh, and how do these individual designers, they must feel lonely and they must wonder what their career path is, especially if they don't roll up into a design organization. What, what's my path? Is my path to become a tech lead or a dev manager or, or product, someone in product? What, it, what does that look like for me? So, you know, when you, when you first build a, a team, a design team, an organization that's scalable, what should it be? Should it be centralized? Should it be embedded? There's a great book that expounds upon this beyond what I can communicate called Org, De Org Design for Design Orgs by Kristen Skinner and Peter Mayerholtz. Um, but they talk about getting a bit of the best of both worlds. So ensuring that all designers roll up into one organization, reporting to a single point of leadership, but then distributing those, those designers, having them be organized into skills complete teams that are focused on uh, aspects of the business dedicated to value creation. So the idea is have them organized with the teams, but report them into a centralized design organization. Because something like that can scale and you can focus on what does, a, what does skills completeness look like in terms of what's needed across every team. Some teams may need certain skills over others, um, but you, you can scale that as long as you know that these folks are distributed and alloc allocated towards an, uh, either a team level, program level, portfolio level value creation. Now, let's say 
okay, you, you have your design org or you have designers and you want to integrate them into, into your teams. Where do you start? Do you just put them in with the dev teams uh, or the agile teams? Do you, um, how do they interact? Especially when you're given a new, uh, a new initiative, like a new opportunity and it's a known opportunity. It's on the roadmap. Uh, I usually like to start with the, what I, what I call, or what's known as the experience triad. So this is someone representing what's viable in the business, your product manager, someone who's representing what's desirable to the customer, a designer, and uh, an architect, someone who's representing um, the strategy for what's, what are opportunities that are feasible to implement. But making sure that these three are tight and that they're collaborating. Um, some organizations have a program level. These folks, I would say, operate at a program level. Um, where you have, you know, downstream, you may have um, opportunities coming at the portfolio level. Those need to be broken down into features. Those features need to be uh, understood. The problems need to be framed. The solutions need to be iterated on and, and, and refined, maybe validated with customers. Uh, and, then they, and then the teams uh, will implement. But the idea is start, start having your designer operate in relationship with with these folks and when an opportunity space is known when it comes down from that from the portfolio level saying hey we have an we have an opportunity space that we feel has value to the organization um, let let's refine that let's break that down uh, here are some steps that i'm going to go through uh, to uh, based on my own experience and they may be very specific but um, things within an enterprise organization that designers can do uh, in order to support that middle area of what, what does that experience look like and what's, what is needed for the team in order to implement. So start off with uh, initiating a kickoff. So when there's a known opportunity, the product lead, the design lead, the, the architect, they get together and uh, they align on what the existing research and information is, what the outcomes are. And they, they agree to where does this opportunity fall on the cone of uncertainty. So in any kickoff, there needs to be some understanding of all the, all the information that was gathered to, to, um, to inform that this was an opportunity worth pursuing or, or exploring. Here are some example questions that we like to ask. Uh, and these, are asked, th these questions are discussed and answered between all three all three folks, um, because it's important to set context for the initiative and understand the why and the vision before we move forward, because that will help us understand what kind of activities or what approach we might need to take. Is this such an unknown opportunity that we need to start with um, understanding who the customers are? Do we already know who the customers are? Maybe we don't have to do persona research. Um, do we need to conduct customer interviews though, because we have a sense of the problem space, but we don't really know, we need to refine that down. You know, exactly. Is this a, is this a symptom of a deeper issue? Um, is this so far out ahead that, that the, it would, it would benefit the project to do some envisioning, to do some concepting, to create a, an experience, a vision of what this experience could be, um, to help make sure that everyone's aligned. So. With these questions, there doesn't have to be an answer to all of them. The fact that there's not an answer though helps us understand what our approach should be. Is there enough information that, that we can just start going straight forward and iterating on or ideating on a solution? So, what, um, within design, what, what I've seen implemented and what I also use as well and this scales in an enterprise, is a, uh, a user impact assessment. So as a designer, how can we implement a risk-based decision-making framework can, that can inform our design strategy and investment? This is helpful because I don't, as a designer, do I want to place the exact same effort and investment on every opportunity? Or do I want to scale that investment based on the impact or value? So I make sure that I optimize my time on the things that are most important to the business and deprioritize the things that are least or change my strategy for the things that are the least important. Here's an example of a framework that I've used in the past. 
um, around user impact where you just ask some questions about the usage of this. Something that product instrumentation in your software would help a lot. But you know, what are, what are the total percentage of users that are actually impacted by the outcomes of this opportunity? Is it, is it 10% at one end and 100% at the other end? Um, how frequently do they use it? How critical is it to their operations? How complicated or complex is it? Uh, you can separate that into um, a series of buckets, determining whether it's high, medium, low, marginal. And then you can set a, uh, some requirements against those. So for in the instance where you find that this opportunity has a very high impact to our users, let's make sure that we have requirements against that, that there has to be user research, there, it has to have been uh, tested, there has to be usability studies or tests against it, we definitely have to go through a full accessibility review. Um, within the design team, there has to be at least two critique sessions on the strategy or approach, and then the actual execution of, of, the, of the work. But the idea here is making sure that across all of your designers, there's some clear framework that helps them identify what's necessary and how they should approach the work. Because if you don't have that, every designer may approach it differently. This helps, in, uh, this helps designers in many ways. One way is um, if you have partners and you say, well, here's what we have to do because the risk is so high, here are all the things that we, that we, need, to, we need to work on. They may come back and say, well, we don't have time. We have some constraints and the cost of delay at this point in time is gonna be great. At least we can say, well, in order, in order to reduce the scope though, we need to escalate this. We need stakeholders to agree to assume the risks around the uncertainty because if we're not going to test this, as designers, we at least need to call out what those risks are and make sure they're agreed upon up the chain if we're going to take that out of the process. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, if it's marginal, if, if, and you have folks coming to you saying, we need all the things, designers, we need tons of screens, um, and we realize it has marginal user impact, we could respond by saying, okay, well, we agreed that all marginal activities, we are cons we're gonna operate as consultants. So we will whiteboard concepts collaboratively with the developers, and then we'll consult with them as they implement. So this helps us, this helps us reframe how we approach every project in a way that can maximize our effort towards things that have the highest value. One thing that's really important too in an enterprise design or an enterprise organization with a design org inside is that they need the same uh, big visual information radiators that engineering teams need. We need to make sure that folks are aware of what are we doing? Um, what are we working on? What's important? Uh, what, what did we deem that wasn't important? What are we not working on? Because we don't have the capacity. How do we even know what our capacity is? It's really, we, we need to lift the carpet on design. Uh, there was an era where design, you know, often went into the cave and did their thing. And everyone's like, I don't know, they do magic in there maybe. And then they come out and there's, and then they have, they have artifacts. Uh, when you're in an enterprise organization, you, you have to account for, for this work and you have to do it in a way that uh, I believe aligns to how, how most enterprise organizations do it. So in, in the instance where design, a design team is operating um, in, in Kanban and something I recommend, um, here's an example of the kind of information that you could organize um, in order to surface um, uh, information for conversations with, uh, with um, uh, folks who, who want design uh, resources, who want design support. Uh, we're, we can have those conversations about, well, what do we drop in, in the face of this? What is the impact of what you're looking for? Because we have this, we, this is where our designers are placed. This is what they're working on. Um, this is what we can achieve on a monthly basis. Um, here's how long on average a high impact initiative is versus a moderate impact initiative versus what we've been tracking. So you're saying you want, you, you, you've come to us too late in the game asking for support on a high impact initiative. Well, the, the, uh, uh, the data is telling us it takes five weeks, but we only have two weeks. So, um, this is, this is something that can be done in a JIRA or AHA or um, uh, many different tools will allow us to do this. Um, but if you, are, if you are a designer, if you know of a designer organization, 
it's it's a great um, I, I say it's a valid request to make that we we bring visibility to this information. So what's next? You know, the designer has worked with the team to understand the, the value, the outcomes of the initiative. They've done some assessment on what's at least required, what, what approach they're going to take, the fidelity. Um, the next part is understanding relationships and the types of activities that you're going to conduct. So the design brief here is something I ask designers to, to write up. The planning, the act of planning is more important than the plan itself. But this is just a framework that can scale across designers to say, if you really want to, if, if you really want to figure out how you're going to approach this, we, we need to think about who are all the key players. Um, how are we going to communicate this to anyone? If someone asks, Hey, what are you working on? We, we do need an elevator pitch. Um, what are the outcomes and how are we going to measure them? Let's, let's talk about that before we jump in. Uh, and what's our design plan? You know, what are the things that we are going to say are, are going to reduce, uh, narrow that cone of uncertainty and get us towards a solution? Let's just do a gut check and check them off. This all may look overwhelming, all this information, but I, I believe that this, this can be done in less than an hour. Um, if we have all three folks working together, if we have representation from business design and architecture uh, working together on this. You'll notice that a lot of those activities, those are methods that um, are done collaboratively. It's, they're workshops. One thing that is valuable for an organization to have, it's hard to, it's hard to pull off because it's a lot of content you have to build and manage, but having a toolkit for these methods. So a designer, a designer would facilitate these methods um, in an order that we believe will help narrow the cone of uncertainty and help get us answers to, to our questions. And if we had a toolkit that, would, that we could share with the organization to say, every time you do a competitive analysis or a task flow analysis, this is what it is. This is why you, need, you should use it. It's when, generally when you should use it, what, what are the tools that you should use or the applications that you should use? How long does it generally take? What are the steps? Who else should be involved? What's the output after you're done? Where, where do you put it? Uh, and does this associated with any other methods that come before or after it? If you had all that information for all of these methods and you checked them off uh, and you said, yeah, we believe that this is, these are the activities that we're going to need to do. Uh, then we'll eventually get to a concept. We may want to prototype it. We may want to test it. It's a high impact. We don't know what we're going to learn. We want to maybe save room if we need to iterate again. It could give you some some estimation of how long it would take that you could con convey. Say, if we did all of these things, generally it would take this amount of time, this many weeks. So these are the the building bricks that, if you want to scale an organization, it's helpful to have these, and it helps reframe what design is. That it goes beyond just uh, screen design, just um, doing mockups, and actually facilitating working sessions to help us frame out the problem accurately and help us come to a solution together. So when you execute, um, I believe that's a, a designer facilitates uh, a user informed design process through workshops. And what does that look like when they're actually executing? Well, it's connecting. <laughs> it's making sure we know all the all the folks with the domain knowledge, the experience, the existing engagement with customers that, that um, may, be, uh, may relate to the problem space or the opportunity that we're investigating and figure out how to bring them in and involve them in those working sessions. And it's also engaging your engineering team too in the process and making sure they're included as well and making sure that these, all of these folks are are, are in, at some point included in these working sessions. For instance, ensuring development team at least has had one ideation session where they've been able to gather together with these, these three folks in the middle and just ideate on potential solutions or opportunities based on work that they know will be coming, coming downstream later so that they've had the opportunity to speak into the work. 
um, and to brainstorm together. That helps a lot downstream because the moment they, they're planning and they see the features, they've, they've seen them already and they've actually spoken into them and they have some sense of the value and the vision for them. So it kind of reduces the amount of time needed in planning. Um, so when I say design is connection, when designers come in, they usually often think about the connections that they need to make. Sometimes these are the connections that were lost as an organization scales and to bring them back together. And, and they're responsible for being highly efficient in deriving artifacts that can align these folks. So whether that's a, whether that's a PowerPoint presentation or whether that's uh, a very slick prototype, that type of visual design, the opportunity in an enterprise is filling the gap. It's caused by a loss of connection and a need for shared alignment. Of course, how do you get a dev team to engage though? You're going to need to put capacity allocation towards connection. So if your enterprise organization has capacity allocation, if they do that, they, uh, save some time there to make sure devs and engineers can go out and engage with the organization and engage with customers. If you have a, a, a dedicated UX research practice that is continuously meeting with customers, going out on field visits, uh, get these folks out there, um, put, in, put in, in your capacity allocation that time so that they can engage. Otherwise it's not gonna happen. Um, I completely understand if we have folks on the team, whether they're scrum masters or TEs, program leaders who, are, who want to protect these folks time uh, because they only allocated so much in a sprint that they can accomplish and they're trying to shield folks from the outside coming in to kind of distract. But if you're in an organization where that's a case, the case, I think one of the biggest disruptions, one of the biggest ways to choke innovation in your organization is by starving your engineering team from engagement with the customer and engagement with people in the business who are engaging with customers. So these folks, they need inclusion in all of this stuff. I mean, even, and I go to the extreme, but are we engaging in customer support calls on a cadence and listening in and observing? Are we observing and, and listening in on sales calls related to what we're, related to what we're building? We should be. Uh, but in order to do that, we, we need to preserve the time for it. We need to call it out. So let's say you have a solution and you want to implement it. So this is specific to an enterprise organization and you've probably heard of design systems before, but I'll call it out. Um, so, okay, you're an enterprise organization, you have several services and you're gonna start a new service. Okay, well, you have to make a lot of decisions on the visual components. What's the color? What's the typography? What's the messaging? Are we gonna have toasts? Are we do have modals? Uh, we have pagination and menus. We have progress bars. We have loaders and spinners. Um, how are they gonna authenticate? Um, all of these are decisions that every team is going to have to make. And these decisions are mostly agnostic of your core value proposition. They're things that most every uh, SaaS offering is going to need. So when you're an enterprise organization, if you don't have a design system, if you don't have a, a central component library, are you just asking every team to be making the same decisions over and over again? So now you've got all these boats rowing in different directions. You've got date pickers that look completely misaligned, but even worse, you've asked every team to invest time into it when, when it was answered uh, probably long ago on, an, on, on a product and you could have leveraged that. So why spend your time there when you could just build a common component library that could be leveraged by products. It allows you to scale. So that, so that engineering teams can spend less time on stuff that's agnostic to their core value and more time on the stuff that is. Of course, something like this, um, it requires an actual team to maintain. I think it's worth the investment. It's not something you can just like build and walk away from. It does require, I believe, a dedicated uh, core team to maintain advance build out your models for how, how to govern it, how to contribute to it. So 
I think there is a persistent team that's required for it, but that persistent team, I think, is, is going to lend to far more efficiencies than having folks on every single team trying to make these decisions and then to create fractured experiences and then try and figure out how to get all those fractured experiences aligned, even though they're all different instances. Um, that uh, that's keeps me up at night and I don't code. <laughs> when it comes to enterprise organizations and scaling, um, integrated design dev tools are helpful as well. So you've got the visual design library that design has to say this is our source of truth for how we're, how we're providing our blueprints or our artifacts uh, for implementation. Uh, but then we also have component library or libraries. That's a source of truth for developers on what they can use, the bricks they can use to build. Uh, and then we also need documentation, which is the reference for all the rules and, and, and the code. Um, and the visuals. So it's worth having conversations with your designers about how do we, how do we inter integrate these? <laughs> how do we do this in a way that we can have, have confidence that, that, that there's fewer, fewer handoffs or mitigating the risks of the handoffs in misalignment? So that's a conversation worth having if you're an enterprise uh, organization with design. And lastly, your designers, when they, when you're, when you have engineering teams implementing uh, work uh, experiences that a designer has worked on, invite them to the team ceremonies. You know, whatever whatever ceremonies you believe are necessary for them to be able to support, I'd say bring them in, and um, uh, but also make sure that that can kind of mitigate the need for a design review. But still, I would say add a design review to your definition of done as well, uh, wherever you believe it's the right time. Uh, you know, is it before QA? Um, is, there, is there a risk to ch uh, having to change tests after a designer has come back and said, hey, X, Y, and Z um, needs to be adjusted? But make sure that designers are, are engaged in the implementation process, and at least there's some sort of review uh, at the right time for them to review what was, what was coded up uh, and provide feedback. Of course, that means that we'll need more, we'll need capacity for the, for um, whatever we believe needs to be fixed in that sprint and whatever we believe could go into an experience debt bucket. Allocating capacity for experience debt is also helpful if even as engineering teams, you notice things in your, in your software that you don't believe you can get to immediately that you believe should be adjusted or, or improved. Um, whether that's usability issues, whether that's misalignment in the experience to what we expect. Um, being able to uh, have a backlog of that and just have the capacity to work on those is helpful. Okay, so you built it, you released it. Um, it's, it's launched to customers. Let's talk about measuring outcomes now. So, um, you know, what are some ways that designers prefer to measure uh, or benefit from measuring outcomes? Let's talk about instrumenting your products first with user analytics. Um, I usually say this quote when I talk about the need to instrument your products because the, truly the best time to have instrumented any product is, is when you first started building it <laughs> because you've lost, you've lost all of that information uh, because the only point you can really gather information is the time you've actually instrumented it and understand user behavior. So if you haven't done it yet, do it now because the next best time is immediately find a way to instrument your product and understand the user behavior. And what do I mean by that? So imagine you have a product task flow and you've instrumented your products um, and you, there, was a, there were some support calls about an, uh, frustrations with a specific task flow. So you went and you looked at that task flow and you started to note, note some things, okay. Uh, between tasks three and four, it's taking a really, it's taking longer than usual. Is that normal? Maybe it is, but maybe it's not. We did hear that folks' frustration was, was centered around uh, the point between four and five, though, and a lot of folks started dropping off. And when we think about success of this task flow, this is a key aspect of our product. And, oh, we realize only 20% are actually getting through it. So it helps you correlate the the anecdotes or the feedback you're getting from customers with how pervasive it is. What's the size of the problem? Which is really important. You need the why on the qualitative side, 
with the what on the quantitative side in order to really gauge is this valuable? Is this both valuable to the customer and valuable to the business? So this, without this information, you don't, how do you know how pervasive a problem is that's worth solving? So, you know, here are some, here are some ways in which um, uh, product instrumentation can help answer uh, these questions. On the other side, we want to measure attitudes. So on the, we want to measure behaviors, but we also want to understand attitudes. And when I say attitudes, I, I don't necessarily mean from it from a UX research perspective, I, I don't mean um, necessarily attitudes just with the organization like an MPS would do. Um, you know, the, the desire to recommend or not recommend. Uh, but I'm really talking about how do we correlate somebody's frustration at point in time with their use of the product. So we know exactly where, what their attitudes are when they're actually using the product. So we know where to evaluate and where to, where to resolve that. Um, so it's helpful to have a baseline. So if we have a product task flow and we, we notice, okay, we have, imp through, through product instrumentation, we have implemented CSAT surveys um, to figure out that folks are generally unhappy when they get to step four. Or we have a dedicated UX research practice that's doing continuous research, and they're doing user journey, uh, user journey mapping sessions with customers, and they're actually in one-on-ones with them going through the software, they're getting these readouts. And we've gotten enough of these readouts to know that between steps three and four of our software, Folks are not happy and they're really happy at step seven, but that's only because they've, they've gotten through the, the mud and they've gotten to the finish line. So this helps us understand um, uh, also where to focus on elevating or, or, or um, uh, elevating the experience and alleviating frustrations and where we probably should not spend our time. So it helps us prioritize. And here are some other uh, questions um, that uh, we're measuring um, attitudes uh, will help answer. So to summarize, um, by centralizing design into a single organization, establishing uh, those scalable practices, um, I'd say they, they should include um, for skills completeness, whether that's product design, content strategy, UX research, um, integrating them as part of those value strategy or value creation teams at every level of the organization, uh, implementing those scalable frameworks to support the known opportunities, uh, leveraging design uh, to drive customer engagement into the product development cycle, that's imperative, uh, but also um, investing in a dedicated UX research practice to be continually understanding and continually researching and continually involving product into that as well. I believe that these are some of the things you can do to help fill that experience gap, foster culture of innovation and iterate, hopefully at the speed of conversation. So I really appreciate your time. It was an honor and um, certainly open it up for questions. Yeah, so we got about a little over 15 minutes left here. Uh, it will cut off at the end, so we have some time for questions, which uh, there is a few here. So uh, Travis Parchman asks, we've been asking that our embedded UX designers carve out at least 20% of their time to working on the design system slash component library tribal project. I assume having the folks working on the design system and component library would be the same folks who are out in the world in the product teams is a desirable approach or do we need some folks who are more dedicated solely to the tribal goals of the overall ux org to be more strategic i can read that again if you want me to as long i th i think so i think it's do we can we be successful creating a design system just by having folks allocate a percentage of their capacity towards it right hmm um, my gut is it's going to take longer, uh, and without that level of dedication, a design system is like a product. Um, 
it needs a cohesive content strategy. It, it needs a roadmap. Um, whether you call it a product manager or a design system manager, um, if we're saying only 20% of folks capacity is dedicated to that work and they can't do any more than that. Um, um, I don't know that to, that to me sounds, I don't, I would probably want to have a conversation with you later just to understand more, um, uh, about, uh, what are the, what are the incentives for them to even use 20%? Uh, what are they working on? So I'd say reach out to me in, um, on Slack and I would love to learn more. So even if there's, you know, kind of some general interest in continuing the conversation, uh, I'd be happy to create a, cha a design ops channel if you'd like to, you know, kind of move the conversation there once this is over. Like I've tried it in the past, allocating percentage of designers time. Um, and it's failed only because they were incentive, their incentives were different. Um, and their intent to build a design system didn't align to the organization's incentive to invest. So it kind of flopped. Cool, thank you. So actually another question from Travis Parchman is, uh, we've gotten some pushback on web analytics embedding in Europe due to GDPR and warnings that privacy is going to eventually kill the acceptability of machine analytics from the browsers. Is this purported existential threat to web analytics as a mean of capturing actual user behavior without surveys, focus groups, usability, engagement, or real concern? Uh, are there automated alternatives? Oh my, I honestly don't, I honestly don't know. That's a great question. I have not heard anything. I honestly have not heard anything about the relationship between GDP and the use of web analytics. Um, so um, because I've, I haven't heard anything about it, I, I haven't looked into it. I'm sorry. I, um, I should probably research that. I, yeah, I, I don't know the real, I don't know the, the risk of not having it in um, or, or the risk of attempting to put it in against those laws. I certainly know the risks of not having it in. <laughs> And I would I would be very crestfallen if 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 um, any any limit there's any limitation uh, from international law to at least allow us to understand how to um, uh, how to set um, conditions for success and failure in what we're building um, that seems critical. So cool, thank you. Uh, now there's two questions from I apologize in advance if I mess up your name. Uh, Yash Prabhu, uh, our question is, in teams I've worked at, we've lost a lot of institutional knowledge because designs or design systems have not been documented or we've switched between Zeppelin, uh, Envision, et cetera, to another tool or to turnover. How do you solve this problem? Uh, okay, so yeah, so you move from Zeppelin to somewhere else. Um, yeah, and you do lose all of that, especially if you go to Envision. Um, so, I'm, I'd be curious about what, what the long-term reference is of that. What I've seen organizations do is invest, invest heavily in documentation and make it a priority. So, uh, of course, if you're a design organization, you need to hire folks in to build that and to maintain that. But I think it's essential. So if, if you are an enterprise organization and you have a design group in, uh, there, I think you should hire, uh, depending upon the size, you should hire... Um, um, either a, a design program manager or someone uh, whose exclusive role is design operations and um, figure out how to, how to establish and maintain that level of documentation to ensure that there's alignment and make sure maybe those are segmented from those tools that are being used. I'll be curious what exactly uh, in institutional knowledge you're trying to, you're attempting to reference um, reach out to me because if it's like, well, you know, we built something a year ago, we want to go look at the screens and yeah, if the screens were in Zeppelin and you're not using Zeppelin anymore, yeah, you have to figure out how to get those out or at least migrate them. Of course, design tools, those kinds of design tools are only six years old. So that may be a problem that's pervasive across those design tools, the, the ability to migrate data. So. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, another question from Yash is, uh, what are your thoughts on doing one week design sprints at large scale organizations to move faster? It's 
depends on, on what, you, what you're trying to accomplish. So uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of a design sprint. So uh, for folks who aren't, it's like taking the design thinking process and breaking it down into five days where by the end of it, you've, you've rapidly uh, attempted to understand uh, the problem space, um, converge on a specific uh, direction, uh, ideate like crazy on another day, uh, form, form a prototype uh, of sorts, uh, test it and get immediate feedback and, and learn. Uh, I would certainly recommend experimenting with that. There's a great decision tree online, I should post it, about um, uh, when is the right time to use a design sprint. I don't have it in my head, but I can send it off as a reference on, you know, what's a good time to use it as opposed to maybe you should be doing some, maybe you should be elaborating on, the, on, a, on a broader process because of the impact and the risks. Um, so I can send that along. Thank you very much. Uh, so I've, uh, I created the, oh, we have one more question. Uh, Mohammed Fani asked, any suggestions on how to find a sweet spot for using default UI layouts and components versus custom UI layouts and components? Uh, for example, Apple recommends to a lot to a lot its own because it reduces engineering work. It's already hooked up to work with accessibility and the designs don't change much if a designer is replaced by another. Or wait, is that? Yeah. Hmm. So the, the tension between, uh, I'm wondering, do you mean like a, uh, leveraging an existing, fra uh, existing framework out there versus completely building our own custom framework? Or do you mean like in the instance where a team says, I have a I have a new component I want to use or I want to create to solve this problem, and say, and pushing back and saying, no no here's what we have, um, you know use these you don't need to use that. Uh, I'm just not sure which which one. The first uh, the first one you said. Um, I got gotcha. you. So yeah, suggestions on finding a sweet spot for using uh, kind of the yeah prepackaged uh, layouts and components or you know custom. Um. I have, oh, um, I Apple, think I, like, okay. His example is Apple's UI kit versus, uh, you know, a company's custom UI. Oh yeah. So, um, I've gravitated more towards using an existing one. Um, there are open source, there are, there are frameworks out there that there's so much behind frameworks. I mean, one is accessibility. Um, the amount of the, the amount of effort it would take to, to build out a custom uh, framework versus leveraging your own is relatively uh, is huge. Um, our, our organization, we, we're, we're evaluating a, a, a framework um, that you know the designers can immediately take into their design tool and then um, uh, take some adjustments to it and um, to align to our brand tone and voice and immediately uh, start leveraging. Uh, at least from the design side, that's that that just that shaved months out from the time it would have taken us to say, well, we're going to just design our own date picker. So there's, there's common components that we believe the mental model is so pervasive, so ubiquitous, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. And that makes more sense to utilize something that's existing. If there are instances though, even if you utilize an existing framework, there might be instances where you say, ooh, there's this really unique use case. And it's not like a, it's not like a, a reference data or CRUD or, or or like uh, data importing, it's, it's something that's really unique to our organization. That may be an instance where you wanna create something custom because it cannot be, it, it's, it's, it would be unique or specific only to your, your customers. And it's not so pervasive out there that you can just reference. You can say, well, most people expect this to work this way because they've used it elsewhere. Let's just use that. And you would have to do the investment to create something custom then. I, a question I actually have is, uh, what like, do do you have any tools that you you know particularly love, and that could be a you know a thing for, you know that could be anything from I I don't even know a, a wireframing tool to you know something where you actually make you know designs and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, we use so at at Vertex. Um, We've been looking at um, whimsical. Uh, now that now that we're all remote, you know, what are the remote collaborative tools that uh, will augment the whiteboard? Uh, and you know, of course, when you go remote, 
and everyone's like, well, we need a whiteboard tool. We're thinking the model in our head is we need a tool that looks like us taking our mouse and drawing on a white page. It's like, that's, that's not the reason we, we all use whiteboard tools. Um, sometimes we're using it to diagram, to, to, to get to align on what's the, what's the UML or, uh, or what's the, the task flow in my head and does that match what's, you, what's in your head? And I don't wanna have to go on a tool and draw with my mouse to do that. It's not fun. Um, I want a tool where I could rapidly create um, flows and diagrams and do it with other people. So whimsical is one example of that. And you can do mind maps and um, collaborative mind maps and uh, user story maps uh, and wireframing in there. So that's one tool that we found ourselves using more often now that we're all remote. Another one is um, uh, in terms of, you know, if you used a whiteboard for um, post-ups, uh, like if you were doing a retro, if you did, usually did retros in a room and you put all your sticky notes up on the board uh, and then you, uh, you clustered them and you did some affinity mapping and then you did dot voting. Like if those are the kinds of exercises that you did uh, in a room, you don't want a whiteboard tool. You, you want a tool that helps you workshop. So tools like Miro or Mural, these are, these are tools out there that will replace that intent. Uh, and I think, and I, so I would say, look at those because you're certainly want to get something where you can actually create post-its and you can see each other moving them around and you can actually cool. turn voting on. So. Cool. Yeah. I, I, Mira is actually one that I have used in, in the past. I was just, you know, I always, I don't, I always like asking people what their uh, prefer, preferred tools are. So we have uh, a little over two minutes and there's uh, one more question from Matt Kelso. Matt asks, is the sweet spot distinguishing between widgets and components that have common interactions and screen layout uh, slash interactions? And then any thoughts on easily standardizing the latter that doesn't eat up too much development time or put design and development on rails too much? Can you say that again? Yeah, yeah. Is the sweet spot, hold on, is the sweet spot distinguishing between widgets slash components that have common interactions and screen layout slash interactions. Any thoughts on easily standardizing the latter that doesn't eat up too much development time or put design and development on Rails too much? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I understand what you're saying. Um, so yeah, when you're, when you're building out components, there's, there's different layers to them. And I know that, um, um, is it Brad Frost and Atomic Design? The, the idea that, yes, there, there's like a visual design layer that we all want to align on. We want to make sure all the colors are the same. There, is a, there, is a, there are components that we want to align on because they, sh they are pervasive. Um, but then- Matt, Matt did update. He said, for example, using a framework state picker makes sense. Does it make sense to spend time codifying? This is how we do X type of screen. Yes, yes. So yeah, we're aligned, yeah. It makes sense to provide guidance if it's a if it's a type of screen where we're intending to solve the same a similar customer pro problem across multiple services. It makes sense to provide guidance in documentation on what that could look like. You have thirty seconds. Oh, it'll, and it's yeah, it'll it'll it's a. I think it'll I told you this. Off. Yeah, it'll kick us out. <laughs> it makes sense to provide more guidance than than strict guardrails around. Here's how it's being done elsewhere. Here's our recommendations. There's always going to be requirements across services that are going to be unique. And we want to make sure that at a page level, there is there is enough flexibility to do that. Well, thank you so much, Josh. We have five seconds. If you guys want to continue the conversation, I created a design ops channel. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation. And uh, Yash actually commented beautiful slides, which I completely agree. Yeah, thanks. So that was really cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time.